Welcome to Conversations with Karalia, where we take a nuanced deep dive into all things related to spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. My name is Karalia, and I'm your host for this journey. I invite you to relax back, open up, and get curious. And don't forget to subscribe, like, and share the love. Alrighty, folks, we're back. Yes, it is indeed another episode of Conversations with Karalia. And today on the show, I have with me Kim Sama. Now, Kim Oh my goodness. I think the first time I ever met Kim was actually at a party in Langholm, uh, West Auckland. Um, I spent a bit of time with her down at Hyden Manor when I went to Eden Festival, which was a somewhat controversial move because a lot of people have issues with Hyden and also with ISTA. Um, and they're raising very um, pertinent questions around it, for sure, no doubt about that. Um, there's been some reported cases of abuse and boundaries, transgressions, etc. And people have been collecting that evidence and trying to get change happening at Haydn and at ISTA. So I went to Eden Festival because I was invited and I wanted to see for myself what was going on and feel into it. Um, anyway, I go down there and I end up hanging out with Kim and we have some pretty cool conversations and she said yes to coming on the show, which I think is pretty awesome because anyone who's associated with Esther right now or Hayden knows that by coming into a public sphere and speaking about some of the related things that they might get roasted, right? Um, and what I'm trying to do with these conversations is hold a more neutral space. Um, anyway. Kim, let's talk about who Kim is. I don't want to go too deep into that stuff yet right now. So Kim, well, she's got a degree in education psychology, and then she's also got qualifications in massage and embodied counseling, somatic sexology, tantra and sacred sexuality, um, erotic exploration through yoga of sex and erotic blueprints, immersive somatic healing modalities for non-acute exploration of trauma, and themes related to limiting core beliefs like whoa and wow there's going to be some really interesting things I want to dive into like what I find quite often like I've done a lot of um study etc and the tantric traditions that doesn't include anything to do with sexuality and so I'm always really interested in the difference between neo-tantra and tantra and specifying so I guess I'm kind of curious to talk to Kim and ask about you know is it neo tantra that she's talking about or is it traditional tantra that she's talking about um definitely want to talk about the sexuality thing for sure um yeah so stay tuned we're going to get right into this conversation and as always do stay to the very end because i'll do some reflections and a wrap up after i've finished speaking to kim Kim, welcome to the show. <laughs> um, you? First up, your last name, I don't know if I pronounced it correct on the introduction. Is it Sama or like? So yeah, Sama, double A. And yeah, like it means mind and the heart. So that's my journey to bring my very rational, you know, Western mind down and more embodied heartfelt space of love. Ah, I love that. So how do you self-identify at the moment? Because, you know, I, I, I've interacted with you. I've kind of read the website. Like when people are like, what do you do? What do you say? <laughs> What's your elevator um, pitch? Yeah. Oh, hello. My name's Kim Summit. No. <laughs> <laughs> um, I call myself a sex and intimacy guide at the moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I say at the moment because it's like, how do we... How do we call these things? It's a bit in between because I do a bit of therapy and I do a bit of, um, you know, therapy in the sense of therapeutic work. It's healing and guidance and coaching and, yeah, not so into the word coach. I don't want to be a coach as such, but to walk alongside, to guide with. Mm -hmm. So what's the parameters of the work that you do then as a sex and intimacy guide are you just working with words or with bodies and is it single bodies or do you make contact with clients like 
great questions. <laughs> uh, and yes is the answer. <laughs> Yes to all of those. <laughs> yes to all of that. Yeah, so make contact. It depends. Have really clear um, conversations about intention and desire at the beginning of any um, any like group of work um, in the sense of if we're, we're trying to reach a goal or create um, some kind of ongoing impact or an experience. So it really depends what a person is looking for or a couple or a thruple or a group is looking to experience right so you work with thruples and groups as well I love that word thruple <laughs> thruple yeah all configurations um so people might be wanting to learn to pleasure each other in a mm. certain way or they might come to me because they want to experience tantra so I clearly tell them you know this is the aspect of tantra that is western neo-tantra that we've extracted because it really is my belief that the divine is in the body, that this embodied existence is part of the great gift of mm. being human. Um, so if they come to me and they want to experience something in there, either it's sexological or it's um, touch-based or it's, yeah, it can be anything and to learn to touch each other in certain ways. So more of a meditative, more of a, you know, that central channel, the chakra systems to open, to harmonize, to work out stuff that's going on. They might be kind of like this, you know, like mm -hmm. not making it. And that can be a thruppledom. It can be um, a coupledom and it can be people with their own individual sexuality. You know, also mm -hmm. working with porn addiction, um, mature ejaculation, and, you know, who teaches young people, well, no one taught me for sure, and like, they still don't really, yeah. how to um, engage in pleasure and to really expand into what is available as a sexual being. You know, there's that quite narrow bandwidth that's horny, which is mainly what... Um, what people learn or what they come across and then they think that's their norm mm -hmm. so often what stop me if I'm going on <laughs> I'm no, I'm it. about great. it obviously yeah but um people come to me because they realize there's something missing and the word tantra seems to call them in because mm -hmm. it, it denotes a certain alignment to something deeper more spiritual more loving softer and if all they think you know their sexuality is meant to look like is porny and that's not working for them then um they're sort of looking outside the box hmm. porny I like that I think I've never heard that as a word but it makes so much sense <laughs> oh I think I made it up but it just helps to explain it's like yeah well that's a yeah. porny style and um that's great but it's you know if you've got a whole keyboard we want to play the whole keyboard right yeah. you don't want to be stuck playing um around middle c Mm -hmm. so I heard you mention like when you mentioned tantra you then qualified and said neo tantra the little the piece that was extracted out can you share with me yeah some of your journey into how did you discover neo tantra yourself and how do you explain do you do you explain it to people as separate or different from traditional tantra when you're working with clients or is it irrelevant to them as such yeah yeah it's mainly relevant to them yeah uh, <laughs> yeah and I do explain it but mainly briefly because what I'm most interested in is um how I can serve them so what the word tantra means to them so I ask them what they what they came for what it was that attracted them um yeah, and how I came to that is mm. that I came through Buddhism and meditation at a time in my life that was quite difficult for me. Um, I was separating from my partner, really questioning purpose and soul and, you know, what I was doing. And I started to do mindfulness. And then I was like, well, this is interesting. How does this work? So I looked into Buddhism and then I um, became quite a practicing Buddhist. And then I went into yoga, did a year-long yoga um, course and part of that we were looking at uh, philosophy and the different modalities of um, yoga of which tantra is you know one modality and so my path was sort of that was and then there was a period that they just walked alongside because after my divorce um, which I describe as thinking I was going to jump off a building and the parachute would open but oh dear <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I think a lot of divorces now that I work with people, it's it's like that. It's like, oh yeah, we're gonna do this thing, and it's just took so long to get back together. So I started. Um, what I did do is I started exploring and what I call sex exploring. So I found the Eden Festival, Conscious Sexuality. So I was going to find the pieces of me that hadn't ever felt expanded or really felt um, felt that I'd found um, the ecstatic. I had a longing, like a yearning for that, um, mm. to find the of my sexuality. Yeah. So what were you doing for work before you were doing this? And and what was kind of the journey into doing, you know, this kind of intimacy work with people? Uh, so, yeah, I was a massage therapist. Uh-huh. Look, I've just got classic mistake for beginners. Like I work in person. I don't have, um, I need to go and get my charger. Yeah, no worries. I'll hit pause and we'll be back. When can I okay, have my charger? Okay, thank you. All right, we're back. Kim's now plugged in. We're going to have yeah, plugged charge. in and turning the switch on. Oh, turning! <laughs> Better turn it on, Kim. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, now she's turned on. Very nice. Okay. <laughs> All right, so we're talking Ooh. about what you used to do for work and how you ended up doing what you do now. <laughs> Great. Yes. Um, yes. So I used to, what did I do for work? I have a degree in psychology and then I really didn't know what I was going to do with that because it seemed so all in the head. So I did multiple things and for 13 years I lived in Italy and I was married to an Italian man and I ran a sports center in the mountains and went snowboarding every day and we had a panino tech on the ski slopes. Um, And then I wanted to do what I'd always wanted to do, which was massage. So I came back to New Zealand as I was divorcing and learned to do massage and just, actually I found God when my anatomy teacher was also my yoga teacher, (laughs) described the way a cell works. I was just like, oh my God, this is amazing. So for me, anatomy was just a way into the divine I just thought it was incredible and I have not stopped learning since so I did that at what was Well Park College I did my remedial massage then I taught massage for a long time an NCQA course and then I wanted to keep going deeper I just kept wanting to go deeper Mm. And then you found Eden Festival and Conscious Sexuality. Eden. And then I did ISTA, which changed my life. So the International School of Temple Arts. And Mm -hmm. then I did a practitioner course with them. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been studying ever since. I did an embodied counseling course with the Sexological Institute of Australia. I've done somatic immersion for trauma therapy um, and just I, in 2019, I just, I realized what I want to do is work with people um, in intimacy. I love to be with people in their full authenticity where everything is welcome and we can explore what's really, really alive for them, what's intimate, what is, with things that they can't talk about with anybody. I mean, Mm. I have a fascinating, um, like a fascinating work life. I really love what I do. I kind of want to ask you for the best work stories, but I'm not sure if that violates. <laughs> I'm thinking about writing a book because I'm like, wow, oh, some of it's so interesting. I mean, without violating any client confidentiality, can you give us a little snapshot of something? <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. Well, just, yeah, just it's one just time. Making sure one time what happened is so many. I mean, you know, something that happened today, I was just saying, I just had a beautiful session with a gorgeous soul who is um, in a wheelchair. And I just love it because it has a brain like mine, right? So has been reading about Tantra and really studying it. And so this is a way in, you know, each of us has different, what we might call portals or doorways. But anyway, and so when I was starting to move the energy and suggest the breathing and so it starts to have like full body shakes and orgasmic waves and it's just like wow wow nothing like this ever happened and just this beautiful soul so there's something I mean you probably know transfiguration when I'm with someone it's just like this being just like me wants love and pleasure and so I really see these 
the soul incarnate and and just the joy and mm. <laughs> as we mm. were working mm. so um yeah just this juicy beautiful sort of orgasmic wave of of life force like the yeah. aliveness and it was like wow my body feels really different and of course sitting in a wheelchair like you get really tense and tired and um mm. so that's one that was just like today and yeah so just listening to you I'm aware that some people won't really get understand or had felt experience of like energetic orgasms for example or starting intimacy from those energetic planes and then allowing it to express through the physical so I think it might be useful to kind of break down what what's an energetic orgasm what do you mean energy what you know just imagine someone's uh, never encountered that <laughs> um yeah so i'd invite everybody to rub their hands together <laughs> this is so ex experiential it's so hard so and then just put them a little bit apart if you've never yeah so you can feel that and um you just play with it and feel what's there and we all have this field, like we've just activated it with, you know, kinetic with motion. Yeah. So um, if you put that up close to your cheek, for example, uh -huh. and then you might want to stroke just a little bit, but we can feel that. And so, yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> <It's so good. laughs> <Yeah. laughs> you keep going and I'll explain. <laughs> so, anyone can keep doing that um and so this field that we have that is energetic you know it's not woo woo to talk about energy so if anatomy is structure then anything moving in the body including including like the nerve impulse which is electric um the fluids everything is alive the atoms themselves are moving so it creates this electromagnetic field so that's the premise then the energy all has a, it's simply the different centers in our body we all know that sexual energy has this real hotness you know when we're activated there's aliveness there's you know there's a heat you can feel the heat yeah that yeah. movement <laughs> juicy and um so by allowing it to move and sort of i'm making this motion up my body like allowing it to move up and to feel it through the whole body and by using the breath and hi, ah, just breathe and allow it to travel everywhere. So you cross the bridge of the throat, we're often like just a talking uh -huh. head and it will stop here and we're not like, oh, okay. Whew. And so by allowing it to move and consciously, I'm using, um, you know, I guess my hands as well to move the energy, then I'm supporting it to move around the whole body. And as it starts to flow through that central channel, mm -hmm. people start to feel shivery and shaky and they feel um, tingling in areas that never felt it. And so the energy orgasm itself, like if I tap into it, there's just that real feeling of whoa, shaking like an animal might shake or the whole body starts to to move and shake and that's not immediate but it really is when we breathe out and soften and relax and allow the whole body to receive um or to experience what is actually already there and then the connection between the two people and with that that hot fire of the the um erotic energy allowing what is in the pelvis just to move and it doesn't have to be horizontal as in with someone else so we can do this in alignment with the the vertical so that's in our own chakra system where the upright animal you know mm -hmm. between heaven and earth papatunuku and ranganui um so allowing that that flow so if everybody also were to just feel into their pelvic bowl right now and to breathe and expand and just become present with it notice what you notice Often there's just that it's a sensation there and let your body like move and just light mm. flowing ways. We tend to be very stiff. We don't need to hold anything. So you can just open to sensations that are actually there that we're often unaware of or shut off from mm. to protect ourselves or others and to be good citizens. <laughs> so mm -hmm. But yeah, so awesome. Um, yeah. I like it. That's a little like snapshot intro for those those that may not know as such. 
Um, okay, there's a couple of things I want to ask. I'm really curious. Have you ever experienced like astral sex? And what I mean by that is like I was having a bath one time, just fully meditating or whatever, and I suddenly felt someone making love to me energetically. And this is an experience I've had a few times with, you know, partners, or whatever, who weren't in the space with me. And I thought it was my current partner and I'm surrendering to it. And then the person's moving in such a way. And I'm like, wait a second, this is not my current partner. And then I recognized who it was. And I was like, what is going on? How did this happen? Like, how, you know, it was a very interesting experience. I, I, Right, I wrote it in um, my memoirs, Sex, Drugs, and Mostly Yoga, astro sex, astral sex. So I'm curious, have you had that experience or similar experiences? How would you, any insights? Oh, no, I'm just so curious. People have so many gifts and awarenesses. I'm very embodied. Like I'm a really matter being. So mm -hmm. like my connection really is to the energy field around people. Like when I tap into people's energy field and, you know, I can feel the sort of sparkling nature of that, but I don't, I don't see, I, I don't visit the astral planes or, you know, like, unless it's a meditation, I've had experiences making love to the gods and goddesses, you know, as I was self pleasuring right. and just being held <laughs> and yeah, that's so beautiful in the cosmic embrace. Yeah. But I, you know, apart from that, part of my my spirituality my prayer um no I I don't see things and I don't you know I don't have those experiences yeah. I mean this was a felt sense it wasn't like I was seeing anything and it wasn't like I was astro traveling as such um so that's the thing I don't know if that's the correct term it was like I was in my body in the bath meditating and all of a sudden my body's moving and someone's with me energetically um oh. Yeah, I just wonder because you're meditating, maybe your field was open and yeah, and felt it. So I do have like when, with lovers, when I have a really intense connection with a lover for a day or two afterwards, we will send texts at the same time or say the same thing um, via text or, you know, like I'll think something and then they'll say it. So mm -hmm. I, I do believe that our field opens, mm. but I haven't had that experience, mm. but I do, um, I do think the field opens and sometimes, mm. you know, we're, when we're connected intentionally, I think energy follows intention and awareness. Yeah. So, your awareness and intention is then we can feel each other across time and space I think that's why I was curious because this person was not in my awareness or intention or anything and so that may, did make me wonder were they thinking about me were they fantasizing for example about me at that moment I literally felt it happening because I have had experiences with partners when we won't be in the same space or even the same town and I can literally feel when they're sexually active like self-pleasuring or whatever and I can feel it in my, and I got and they have like just messaging are you uh-huh <laughs> because it was <laughs> I, I could just feel it as if they were with me um so yeah Hmm. Yeah, well, I think like you're really open and you're, a, you know, also an energetic being and you do yoga and yeah. you're really, so I think that there's potential for anything to happen. I personally keep it fairly experiential yeah. Um, and yeah, but I, I would say, oh, interesting. And I do believe what I, that we can actually just shut it off. So it's like, oh, yeah. no, I'm not available for that. Or, oh, yes, I will I be available, available for that. that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but making those choices is sort of what can shut us off so that we have choice over um, what we let in and don't let in. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned your spirituality. So I'm curious, considering you've come from the Buddhism and the yoga and the Tantra, how do you, what is your spirituality now? How do you perceive reality? What's your worldview in that way? Yeah, I think um, for me, the because Tantra is monist, so that the divine is everything, we are a spark of the great fire, so that I guess I believe, I believe that this incarnate form, so incarne, because I, you know, speak Italian, like I, I love say, you must speak Italian. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so in flesh, in meat, we are literally in meat, we're incarnate. And that there's something about that that is the vehicle for this journey in this lifetime. There is a reason that this human animal is able to experience so much pleasure and so much connection and so much relational bliss 
hurts and pain, like such a learning. So when I was um, listening to Christopher Wallace, the Tantra Illuminated, something that I really loved was the way he described that like God divided herself um, in order to see herself. So each of us is the piece that is wanted to be known, the piece of life expressing Mm. that needs to be fully expressed and this flesh is the way it was expressed so that we may know ourselves so that life may know itself as us yeah oh, I love that one too that we are just Shakti the goddess expressing herself in all her different manifestations yeah and so that the unique being that you are and all the gifts that you bring I, they're kind of like written, you know, people talk about codes, I don't know much about that, but they are written into the body. So like mm. an animal knows that which it is and knows what to do. We also, and that this body, this unique, because as we are the, kind of the most unique expression of an animal species, mm. each individual being so unique. That's a so really good point. Yeah. In that, yeah, I think there's something in that, in that also, we bring consciousness to this part that is expressing as your unique being and that we feel. So there's that sort of feeling of, yes, when you know that something is, is right. And that's like an animal sense. It is the part of us that yeah. already knows what it is. Yeah. So, so, but we also have this mind which has ideas and conditionings and patterns about who we should be and what we should be expressing or not expressing. And so we don't follow the body, but what, what I realize more and more, and as I work with more and more people, that when people relax into trusting their felt sense, mm -hmm. their unique expression starts to come through more and more. And they mm. know, like they know things they, they thought they didn't know. And yeah, this is my, yeah, back there, follow, <laughs> follow the path. It's like, Oh, that feels good no not that you know yeah. so um and it can be you know it can be really subtle it doesn't have to be a lot of movement I tend to you know have quite an embodied movement mm -hmm. as well um so that is my spirituality actually to yeah. follow um follow the open heartfelt yes of mm. which we are but also you know bhakti yoga I'm a devotional being so there's something in my heart which is devoted to also planetary transformation, you know, individual by individual, to more love, more joy, to to peaceful relation between mm. people, to um, you know, to serving, to service mm -hmm. and to love. Yeah. So, what's to stop that open-hearted kind of following the pleasure channel, you could say, from going into hedonism? for example? Yep. Yeah, good question. Um, I knew you'd ask a question. <laughs> like, okay, <laughs> like, give me a mistake. Yeah, so the heart, it's the open channel. It's the alignment of everything. So um, hedonism for me, you know, often porn is hedonistic. And I'm not saying there's nothing with a good, good momentary hedonism it's not a bad thing right pleasure for pleasure's sake it's not all bad but if the channel is not open if we're interacting just as genitals just as an animal or just as um following that pleasure so hedonism i don't know there seems a negative connotation in what you're saying which mm. would be that serves your own pleasure rather than anything else at all mm -hmm. and i do think that um this question who does it serve what does it serve who's the gift for yeah. Um, and is it serving you, your soul on this planet? Is it serving the other person? Is there someone else involved or other people? Is it serving the planet herself? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the planet is an enormous stakeholder in everything we do. So, my way of thinking. I like know. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> She's like the stakeholder, although maybe the galaxy is <laughs> an even bigger stakeholder. Yeah. Um, yeah. So ultimately then, who or what do you serve? How would yeah um well I serve love I, mm. I try to serve love that is my yeah that is my north star mm. I try to create more love through action and um mm -hmm. and, um and and I have no particular um idea of what that looks like 
but I can feel it, you know, like mm. it doesn't, this in Tantra, it's no goal, no outcome, you know. <laughs> so I don't need to know what that looks like, but it needs to feel like more love. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, so sometimes that's the goddess or sometimes that might be serving a person's um, sexual flow or sometimes I might be hugging a tree or... Mm -hmm. It just looks different every time. Um, I definitely want to talk about Esther, but before we go there, I'd also love to talk about your experience as a woman who is no longer in her 20s or 30s, because I'm guessing you're in your 40s from what I remember. Or I was 50 in November. Oh, yeah. yeah. Congratulations. Bye. Celebration. Yeah. How was that, like hitting that particular master? Because I have to say, one of my good friends, Melissa Billington, who was on the show a little while ago, she just turned 50. And because we're really good friends, what I noticed is it's brought it really into my reality because it's three years away. And I'm like, 50 is coming. So mm -hmm. how was it for you? Well, the yeah, truth. it was great, actually. Truth. <laughs> the um, whole truth. <laughs> truth and nothing but the truth. Yeah. Did you get scared? Uh, uh, not of the number. I mm. mean, I've embarked on the aging process as spiritual practice. Yeah. So as um in the sense that it's a death journey <laughs> as a woman <laughs> like to be quite frank <laughs> um I need to let go like it's, I'm growing out these they're coming in we're going yeah. gray it's, it's looking it's good edgy. thank you darling uh, um and yeah like you know noticing things changing and noticing that it's not like the magazines you know we, we have such a, a life affirming culture uh, a youth affirming culture what beauty is meant to look like and embracing um the ageless goddess a concept i got from christine northrup and actually dropping into more of the queen energy so allowing myself to be less um less sweet you know it's also been an empowerment um <laughs> I am unfortunately kind of nice in some ways, you know, like because I like people and um, and I say unfortunately simply because it's like I can also be dark and powerful, but, you know, there is this excitable part and yet there is also a part that, you know, I'm now almost through the other side of menopause and journeying with that and two years ago also my sister died. Mm. So, um, you know, this journey towards... I guess expanding my capacity to be with life also as death and dying. Yeah. 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 I like that. Expanding capacity to be with life also as death and dying. Yeah. And that takes courage to open to that. And not because you are for being forced to necessarily, but because you're choosing to. Yeah. Yeah, well, I do think life forces us to do that as we age. Yeah. We yeah. choose not to. It's painful. It, it, yeah. And it's, um, yeah. And we see examples of that in the world. And um, I think it's quite disconnected because there is a, a wisdom there to be able to be with others. Like I feel eldership somehow there. Mm -hmm. Be able to be with others because you know at 50 people have died in our lives often or will soon we see our parents um, our relatives aging we've had pain and loss um, yeah and so allowing that actually for myself it's allowing that to be what it is and um working with Stephen Jenkinson his book I love that he talks about dying mm -hmm. um and that it's two sides of the same coin like life is born from death we eat things in order to live and so that there's more joy like you know the more you love something the more potential you'll grieve when something happens if it happens and yeah. also then harking back to the buddhism you know the first noble truth what is it life is suffering mm. and that sounds dire to people but actually what it means is yes the suffering mm. so we can choose also to feel that fully and I support people to um and Ista helped me with this so good segue to Ista mm. actually feeling everything being with emotions grieving doing what needs to be done with the emotions so that then there's more space for joy 
for love. Mm. Um, you know, expanding again, expanding the capacity to be fully with whatever emotion there is. And yeah. and then what I found is there's more joy and there's more life. Yeah. 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 Ditto. It's like the more I can embrace the pain, the greater the expansion into the joy and the bliss as well. Uh, yeah, let, let's talk about this too, because it's obviously been a hot topic over the last few years. I mean, there's been allegations made against um, Baba Deers since, I know, 2017 or so. Um, I don't have all the details, et cetera, in front of me, but of course you'll be aware of the stuff that's been going on for the people watching or listening. How would you sum up the challenge? Yeah, the challenges that ISTA has been facing, the allegations have been made from your perspective. Hmm. Well, yeah. So I have a great love for ISTA because it's so needed and it changed my life. And um, I'm, you know, I, I work with them, I organize um, for them. So, yeah, I just want to premise with that. And I did go to the core with question marks. Like, can, can we upskill? Can we upgrade? I don't know what all the allegations are. So it depends which allegations, really, what I would say. What I will say is that they are humans doing the best they can. And it takes a great deal of courage to try to bring this work. And it's not for everybody. So what I mean there is that we all have gifts. I see it like Indra's net, you know, there are jewels on a web. And lots of different people are holding points. There's the medicine, um, you know, plant medicine crowd. There's the yoga jewel there's the there's different wisdom keepers so mm -hmm. these are the those that are sexual beings and you know I, I i can fully feel my aliveness in that that's one of that's my you know that's an area that is a gift um so that's also there it is a frontier so it was a frontier when us started all those years ago it was baba Dez. And um, he was what co was called a dhaka. So he was working with Tantra and offering sessions. And um, and there were sexual intimacy sessions, right? To yeah. support people to heal and shift. Yeah. 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 And so in there, it's very tender and very difficult because in terms of heart, I know Desa's heart. Like I have felt the, the being that birthed a, a an incredible transformational program and how much love he has and we're working with trauma and sexuality and if you think about it 20 years ago there really wasn't that much information so it was kind of a frontier and just like in lots of things in the world people were trying things out to see what worked best and giving it their best shot and experimenting I think that a lot of the allegations have sprung from um what was the process of growth? And what I love is that it's growing up. So but for someone who's experienced abuse or boundary transgression, I'm just putting myself in their shoes right now. And I think that would be hard for them to hear that they might feel like you're justifying, you know, what's happened and not necessarily acknowledging their pain or their experience. Yeah, and I really don't want to do that. I really acknowledge that people have felt um, have felt that their boundaries have been crossed. I think my like right now, what I'm finding it's just that it's hard to speak to a sort of generalized sense yeah. of allegation. Like I, I don't really know what we're dealing with because some people really did feel that their boundaries were crossed, and I, I'm like really sorry for that and for them I really am you know I've um you know lately I'm working with my own complex developmental trauma um and acute trauma I've also you know like I've had experiences of attack um, myself and I think there's something there in that we sort of we override ourselves especially when there's been past abuse and that was something that was not understood that people's desire to belong and the way that people um so fawning is a big you know like the 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 way that people will perform in order to to you know and I've done this to myself I absolutely want to change I absolutely want to get that thing so I override myself um 
and I don't realize what's happening and it's all a lot. So we're becoming much more intelligent about the way that these things are moving in containers now and mm -hmm. asking, giving people tools to keep an eye on themselves. But whose responsibility and I just don't is it know. though? Like yeah. in, terms, in terms of if you have facilitators and participants and I, I think what you just said is so beautiful and relevant, the fact that people's desire to belong means that they will unconsciously override their own boundaries, particularly if there's previous abuse history, et cetera, right? And I'm also hearing you say that like 20 years ago, I mean, some of these incidents are more recent, five years ago, you know, 10 years ago, that there wasn't that trauma awareness of these dynamics. So what I'm taking as in, being inferred by what you're saying is that the facilitators didn't understand the way that that fawning mechanism would work, the way that that strong human social animal desire to belong would override people. And so when you're putting the responsibility on the participant to self-manage, you see, that's I think that's the piece that, yeah. Which isn't what I'm saying. So yeah. I'm saying yeah. that I'm just saying it was, yeah. So not having specific instances, it's really hard. I know one of the things that people had with us too was facilitator participation. Well, this was actually, you know, like frontier territory because we're it's a permission piece. It's that all of you is welcome. And there can be an incredible potency and reclamation and empowerment there as well. And having so when participants are allowed to um, sexually engage with the facilitator, when they're allowed to approach, so yeah. that has been, I think, that has been a premise that was being worked with. It's like these are adult beings who deserve to feel empowered and to be able to approach. Um, and some of the rhetoric that we hear is that oh, it's facilitators who want to predate, which actually was not the premise for the, for it in the first place. It wasn't about that. It was actually about allowing. Um, allowing a transmission of people who are embodied and who are in in their adult um, mm. consciousness, so connecting, and it doesn't understand how power is working. So at the moment, like that is now, um, that's not something that is on the cards anymore. And I'm, you know, I personally am, you know, really in my own containers. I, I wouldn't want to engage with anybody. Um, yeah, because even though the, I can totally see that from. Esther's perspective that the premise for that was exactly what you said and also I can totally see how the potentiality for abuse and challenges and difficulties because of the way that power works etc so it's great to hear that Esther said okay we're not doing that anymore because I'm guessing because of the, of the allegations and because of the recognition that it's just too problematic given power dynamics yeah they're really listening and we are listening and like you say, actually, some of the allegations were quite recent um, in the sense of the last couple of years. But there's really all the work with Gabo Mate, Peter Levine and Stephen Porges, you know, everything that's coming out really in the last five years um, and becoming readily available. And mm. yeah, it, it's been a tricky journey. It really yeah. has. And there's a lot of pain. And I, I really feel that. And the point that I'm really trying to hold and that I trust is the love that is there. Like at the core, this group of beings that dedicated an incredible amount of time and getting there and all being together and every day, like hour upon hour of discussing these issues and being with them and listening and working it out. And so this is the so core cool gathering. Love. Sorry, to, sorry to just clarify. The core cool so gathering, for the cool gathering and it was in Mexico, right? Yeah. 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 So there's so much desire to to serve, actually, like to serve love and to show up and help the help people to transform and get what they want from life. And so, really, a lot of conversations about how to empower people to do that and how to um, how do we go forward. So at the gathering, one of the, the big things on the agenda, I'm hearing you say, was these different allegations and how to approach and how to do better as an organisation. Absolutely, like listening to what is what is feeding back from, you know, like it's not that um, the world is not speaking through people who have felt that they weren't heard or they didn't have power and they couldn't speak there at the time. And so there, there really is a listening that's happening. Mm. Yeah. I know that one of the issues that's come up that I've heard is that there's a sense that those um, facilitators that have transgressed are still in positions of power or, the, or are not 
being um there's no measures being taken against them and one of the things that i've been curious about is the organizational structure of ista and is, is there mechanisms for censoring facilitators in terms of how do, 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 you, do you know what i mean like if someone no, brings a complaint yeah. about a specific facilitator how is that addressed yeah uh so there's a feedback process now it's on the ista.life page um site rather there is a page dedicated to feedback so it goes through to um a group of individuals who are working with the feedback and there's an accountability process mm -hmm. so each case is taken read and taken each training has um a carefully carefully scrutinized intake form um for each participant and then there's a feedback form at the end mm. and we're now incorporating um during the trainings incorporating self-awareness and you know there's a, so much awareness and there now so whatever comes through the feedback process now and i think that was a big part of the frustration was that there was no kind of process for feedback perhaps yeah. people didn't know where to go or what to do it so ISTA is getting organized. I don't know if you've heard, but it's always referred to itself as an organism because it's organic and there's these beautiful cells that are creating, you know, like I always, I have this, it feels like some kind of octopus, you know, so it's it's quite organic and it's in flow and really trying to listen um, to an expression of spirit and soul as well. Mm -hmm. um, and now it's getting organized this this the idea that it needs an, a skeleton you know it needs structure this organizational piece is coming through um yeah the, there's something there that's very tender to me is that yeah um it's the teachers are dedicated to serving life on this planet and to creating love and to supporting people in transformational growth mm. and a lot of them dedicate have dedicated decades maybe their whole lives um and so that's that kind of soul searching or spiritual seeking as you know like people can go and sit in a cave in the himalayas it's a lot easier honestly Totally, you don't have to interact with people. Good choice. Yeah, people bring you food and bowls. You're all good. They just come to get scarves. Yeah. You know, I'm, not, I'm just joking. I'm not saying it's easy. Yeah. But to come back down the mountain into the marketplace where people are hurting and projecting and maybe you look like someone who hurt them and you're offering transformational change. How do we, how do, we do this? Like we do the best we can. We come to the marketplace and offer um, mm. to use the Buddhist sense, you know, like, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, like, it's, um, for me as well, we had this conversation. It's like a bit tender because yeah. I, I long to serve and to be with people and to support them. And I'm human and I'm scared of being protected on. And I stand up and I teach. Um, teach i offer my own you know retreats of sexuality and that for me it takes courage i'd say like i don't usually say that about myself but to actually stand and to offer these teachings is vulnerable mm. and and who does that you know we want it because this is a, it's, it's why it's exploded and it's in in terms of popularity we want that the the world is longing for mm. this for yeah. us to integrate our sexuality into our spirituality for us to be able to be authentic and to show up we can feel that what's been is not working there's something that isn't yeah there and so people are longing for this and asking for people to stand and when we stand like it, it's you're you're a target you can be a target yeah so i'm not saying it's right but it is tender and yeah. Sure. yeah yeah and i you know i can feel that and i do on your courage and stepping into this conversation with me right because i know that people you know there's a lot of strong feelings around all of this stuff and so I do honor the fact that you're doing that and I appreciate the way that you're leaning in because I'm 
I want to ask some of you know the harder questions like I keep putting myself in that position and of someone who's gone through those experiences and what would they ask and I think one thing that comes up is the use of you know being projected on and I know that does happen but when that phrase is used to someone who's experienced abuse or transgression you know whether or not they're projected it can feel like such a dismissive pushing it back onto them saying you're the one with the problem as such and so that's something you know that's something I have noticed in the language that people around is to use and it can be weaponized it can be a way to deflect responsibility by saying oh you're just projecting on me so how do we how do we navigate that kind of nuance yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think the use of that very small overused word just is significant. It's not you're just projecting on me. Um, and we project, but projection isn't always a bad thing. So people project bold as well. So what it is, is just a part of a, yeah, I mean, it's a, I wish, what other words can we use there? Because it has become like this catchphrase, but what it is, is actually saying, without entering in conversation, for me, what a projection is, is just thinking something like, someone might think a whole lot of things about me because I work in sexuality um, that aren't true. And some of them are gonna be amazing. You know, Maybe they think I'm an amazing lover. Great, it's still a projection because they don't know and they yeah. haven't had that conversation with me. Um, or it could be that I, um, you know, or it could be negative. It mm. could be something negative. So it's not saying it's not true. So that's where I say it's not just a projection because it's not saying it's not true. Mm -hmm. um, it's always part truth, part projection. Because unless you've actually entered into the conversation with curiosity, we actually don't really know what's going on on the other side. So when you're saying this person did this and you're reading into their motives, then actually it is a projection of what you think their motives are mm -hmm. unless there's a conversation there so I think that's why projection is used and perhaps overused because yeah. how else do we say well let's enter into conversation with curiosity with compassion with openness acceptance and loving kindness yeah. and let's like have that. That we conversation. say it like that we say it like that okay <laughs> like, I know that you know, personally I want to know it's like please yes tell me I I'm not perfect I may have done something from my own wounding or from my own habitual patterns that hurt someone in some way that is not my intention so if someone were to project that I just don't care and I did it on purpose that would that would be a projection but if they were ah. to say oh this hurt me and I want you to know that so that I can actually be like wow thank you for sharing that and then whatever I, I actually say or how I feel about that is, is mine. It's not what you're putting on me saying you don't care. You just did this because, yeah. So I'm that, beginning to feel some of those nuances there. There's what happened, which absolutely may have been boundary transgression and or even abuse, right? That's what happened. The projection is when there is an assumption of motive, as in the motive might have been deliberate or uncaring or malicious or whatever, and that can't necessarily be known. Yeah, okay. This is beneficial to explore these nuances. Um, have you have you had anyone who's participated in ISTA ever approach you to talk about um, challenges or, or, you know, transgressions, boundaries, abuse that they've experienced, not necessarily with you, but with anyone? Has anyone ever approached you directly? Yeah, that's a good question because I really don't think they have. Well, yeah. sometimes during a training like I, because I'm present um, for pretty much all the New Zealand trainings um, I'm assisting. So someone may come to me to talk about something that they're having difficulty with, but no, I don't, I don't think they ever have come and said, look, I've got a problem with this um or maybe they have but we tend to sort it out in the moment because if they actually come to me we can work it out so I might be able to say well would you like me to go and talk about that or would you like me to come with you and talk about that or so those sort of instances but not specifically an instance where someone's been like I really feel like there was a transgression here or that there was abuse or mm. One thing I'm curious about, like if I was a person who experienced these things and yeah, there's a feedback process now, but I think I would feel a bit like 
I don't know if I trust the process or I necessarily trust who's accountable. Like I may feel like I don't trust ISTA, the organization, the you know, the facilitators anymore. So is it third party, you know, the accountability, the feedback, is there a third party aspect or is it handled in-house or? It's uh, so in the first instance, if someone is comfortable. So what we're also really aware of is you may not feel that you can at the time or may not realize at the time, speak to somebody, although we hope you would, because, um, you know, on the team of people there, there should be somebody at least that's aligned when we have smaller groups um, called pods where people could actually speak at the time. So that's the first level. But there is uh, safe mediation. So the feedback form goes through to third party mediation. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. that's really so awesome. I've put that on the ISTA community. So all the graduates, you know, on the community page, um, have access to that form if mm -hmm. they want to yeah mm -hmm. and I, I would encourage I've encouraged everybody to to fill that out mm -hmm. um, especially if they had anything that they didn't say at the time yeah because you know. it can be impossible to speak up and at the time etc so many different fears so many so many different conditionings to act I mean it's really hard it can be really hard in the midst of something especially if you paid a whole lot of money for it you traveled a long way something happens it's like you know, freeze, all those things. Um, yeah, yeah, so this is, can I say something about that? Yeah. Because I don't know if I'm allowed to say this, maybe. Can I use the F word? You can on my podcast. <laughs> so for permission to fuck up, that's something that I like to give people. It's like, if we're practicing how to say yes, we need to find our no. So I didn't find my full absolutely, oh, yes, until I found my no, no, no. But if I haven't really known my boundaries, especially if I've had abuse or, you know, like especially in childhood or I don't know what boundaries are because you might have had a no or you might not have been able to say anything or, you know, like, um, so trigger alert there for anybody. So deep breath. So if this happens, you know, we also need a safe space in which to experiment. And that's what we're trying to provide. And so this full permission to fuck up means it's like, yeah, we're going to try that out. So I think it's a yes. I think it's a yes, even though maybe it's a no. And then you're like, oh, no, 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 no. You know, I found a boundary. Because actually we're experimenting with boundaries. We're experimenting with knowing our yeses and our noes. And the whole week is really an experimentation in that. And that that's the fundamental thing. Because once you've got your yes and your no, you're fully empowered. Mm. you know you're like yes no it's um well you're not fully empowered just at that moment but it's a big part so this piece about actually sometimes and I do this in life all the time I do this with my family I don't know if you do this with your family but you say yes when maybe it was a no or maybe it was a maybe or and then you're like oh no I said yes and it was actually a no and that can happen in so many ways in life. It's just mm. because we're in a container that is also working with sexuality. Yeah. But actually, we can go, we can get it slightly wrong and still be okay and breathe ourselves and resource and resource each other, co-regulate, self-regulate, be like, okay, I see how I do that in life. Some of those are the biggest aha moments for people. Mm. I think when I talked about who's responsible, like in those moments, right, when a participant is saying yes, but it's actually a no, isn't it the facilitator's responsibility to be able to discern, be able to feel that and go and, and to guide, you know, to guide? Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Is it? It depends where you're at. And I think this is also one of the questions now. Yeah. Um, if you're not ready and have not done any work on your own trauma or if someone is, it's probably not a great place for it, but, you know, for you to start yeah. working on something. And yet the most incredible things happen where things are transformed and pop because the group energy is so supportive. Mm. I think that the, the complexity is that they're really very nuanced and there's yeah. probably no right or wrong blanket answer yeah. to any of this yeah. and I'm just glad that the conversations are happening 
Yeah, I think it's so beneficial. And I applaud those people that have stood up and spoken up because it's bringing the conversation in, because Esther is listening and making changes, et cetera. Um, if someone who's experienced the abuse or allegations was to come to you now and say, hey, I'd like to have a conversation with you around this, how would how would you feel? How would you respond? Mm. Uh, well, I would love them to, to reach out and I'm really available for that. And I would probably have um, a third party there just mm. because I think that actually there's something in, in the person holding the witness and that may be someone of their choice or it could be someone of our choice, uh, our, as in, you know, safe media. There's lots of um, yeah. So if it really was a conversation that needed to happen, I, I would want to do that in a formalised way with mm. with witnessing because again in that one-on-one -on -one conversation um we also need to be supportive of what what is happening for that person so yeah. I may not be the ideal person for that I might want someone else there mm -hmm. um and I think that would probably be the way forward yeah mm. I love that it feels really wise and and nuanced right yeah Hopefully. <laughs> I mean, it's tricky try. territory. I'm, I'm just watching the light yeah. fall. I'm going to turn the light on in my room because I'm. I'm I thought like it was I'm getting going. darker. It looks. Yeah. I was like, wow, that's really. It's a beautiful, it's beautiful moody. quality to the light. <laughs> yeah. I'm getting like a, a Miami tan as well. I don't know if that light's going to make much difference. Oh yeah, we got a little bit more light. Okay. Nice. Epic. All right. We're moving towards. Tan. Yeah. Yeah. Moving towards wrapping up. Um, I just want to say I really appreciate you exploring this because my sense of it is that some people have just felt like Esther hasn't taken it seriously enough. They've felt like Esther has deflected or defended or made it as if it's the participant's problem for not having dealt with enough trauma or not being experienced enough or whatever it is. And just feels good to be able to explore it because I feel your tenderness in it. Cause I can feel how much, you know, this matters to you and you care about the organization as well so I appreciate you just being here in this space exploring the situation yeah and I just wanted to say that I care about the organization because I care about the beings there but because I care about the work that it brings to the world yeah and and I really believe that there's a lot of gold there um, mm. and also just want to say I'm not the as the spokesperson so this is me yeah. Kim yes absolutely yeah. I think that's why I appreciate even more because you're kind of going out you are going out in a limb to a degree you as an individual just reflecting on these questions I'm asking you as an individual who's part of ISTA um yeah yeah, yeah. and I know there's pain there and I'm I'm available for it yeah yeah <laughs> Oh, all right. So what I'm feeling into is a shift in energy and <laughs> um, to kind of close up. You know what? I want to ask this question. It's on your website. What is Yoni mapping? <laughs> okay. I never had it, obviously. <laughs> yep. I can guess, yeah. but I want to hear it from you. <laughs> great. That makes me laugh because it's like, oh, great. Well, that's where we... <laughs> That's how we uh, go in and map what is inside the yoni. So the yoni is a Sanskrit word for um, sacred temple, which is the external vulva and the internal uh, vulva, the vagina rather, on a woman. So that is the yoni. Um, I kind of want to get my cushion. Can I get my cushion? Go on, get your cushion. Okay. Oh my god! Great. What oh do you think is going to be this on the cushion? Be... Ruby. Ruby is my cushion. Groovy is your cushion? Ruby. You're going to love her. Oh, Ruby. This is Ruby. So <laughs> this is the first vulva and vagina that we have had on Conversations with Carolia. We are breaking new ground. Yay, new territory. Ruby, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> so I just... this is the vulva, all of this, the external part with the hair and the... um. The labia the external part here and then the vagina at the entrance there oh. so ruby you're on tv or something <laughs> great um so she's anatomically correct i don't know if you can see her i love it so like the little jewel at the urethra and the clitoral hood and there's the, cl the clitoris is oh the jewel my goodness 
so beautiful. Um, so yoni mapping is actually, we say mapping because you're actually looking at, um, so this motion, which would be like this, we're mm -hmm. looking finding um, mapping the territory so for a lot of women they may not actually know what parts of the vulva feel like you can do a lingam mapping lingam is a wand of light which is the masculine as well um but otherwise often, known as a cock otherwise known as a cock and balls <laughs> whole shebang and oh, the whole shebang reading. sorry and, balls, uh, i left you out he left out the balls i don't in real life promise so right interesting fact the um, scrotum are the same as our external labia because we're the same until seven weeks old and then um, the masculine starts to come together. Wow. Yeah. So, um, yeah, and mapping so that you know the territory. Why do we map? is simply to come to understand the territory so that we go through and explore different aspects with touch and we just wait and allow someone to feel. So maybe someone's experienced some um, pain or trauma or had um, even an operation or maybe they're a little numb maybe they don't experience pleasure or maybe they do and they just want to find out so we go around literally like um you kind of work in sections so, yeah so you'd say <laughs> this is 12 o'clock yeah one two so six o'clock is down at the anus so we're working around and you go around sort of at different levels mapping out internal and external sensation mm -hmm. so, you know you're working with someone and saying okay now this is your right inner labia this is your right outer labia so we start outwards and it's really a conversation that yeah. you have the whole way so actually being with someone and saying now what are you experiencing and is it okay if I how would it be if I were to touch your external labia so we never go inside there's nowhere to get to again Mm -hmm. But we're actually just getting a sense of what different areas feel like mm -hmm. and when you're not in direct erotic engagement and, um, and, and an eros and arousal, there, there can be pain and there can be numbness. And then we just wait and see what happens there. And under that sometimes is the pleasure. So we're also bringing in the possibility to really feel um, whereas often if there's eros running and the energy connection and there's a, a polarity and a desire, um, then we might not feel the subtleties of, mm. of what is. Mm. Uh -huh. So it's not, it's not a sexual thing at all. It's a mapping of the territory to determine where there might be pain or numbness and to, so once you've identified that, once you've mapped the territory as such, how do you then work with it to, like unthaw the numbness or to heal the pain yeah because it can also be mapping um finding pleasure right so we find yeah. where there's pleasure and you know pleasure and arousal are welcome but that's not the goal it's just yeah. that some curiosity and and this is part of the gift of the mindfulness practices you know like mm. oh and what's that like and what's that like so we're just discovering and if there's numbness Often what happens is under numbness, there can be a little pain and under pain, there may be pleasure. So mm -hmm. sensation simply as sensation with curiosity. And we know that tissues like trigger points in the body, anywhere on the body, we work with, um, we somatize. So it comes into the body and we can have emotional content there and we can have somatized experiences. Mm -hmm. And in our hidden depths, we literally hide things we often hide shame and experiences yeah. that were difficult and and then we contract around them so the body supports us our best friend absolutely supports us by contracting to hold that for us until there's a safe space or until we're able to allow that to bubble up and just mm. like if it's the water and then you know so um it's quite a journey it's very beautiful do you find that when you're doing the Yoni Mappy that people do start to go into trauma responses or memories, things they may not have been aware had happened? Like, Yeah, not so much that they weren't aware of. You'll have memories come back. So, I mean, this is from body work. I also know that when you're working with the body and the fascia particularly holds memory for us until we're ready and it'll harden up, like plastic becomes brittle, you know, and then we soften it. So we want it to be like a malleable sort of taffy and that's got more available pleasure and the nerve endings aren't all stuck. And so it'll hold these memories and things until we can. 
And so they don't go into a trauma response. If someone goes into a trauma response, then I would immediately, you know, we use pause and hold and I would bring them back, slow it down. We want to take small chunks where we're able, it's again that building capacity to be with whatever is. Mm. But it's actually being able to be with the memories and to be with the sensations, sometimes even just sitting down between someone's legs. I actually had a session, so you're asking about sessions. Mm. I spent half an hour just sitting while she processed what it was like to have someone she didn't know very well sitting there. Like and 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 she was processing the whole time. Yeah. And going in and out of the ability to feel and then breathing and self-resourcing and coming back. So we what's called titrating. So we're going in in yeah. small chunks. We come in and out. And it's only what your nervous system, so you're in your window of tolerance, only what you can deal with, you know? Yeah. Um, and that is where actually you're able to be with what was, and then it releases from the body. The animal yeah. can let it go. Yeah. Yeah. Such powerful work. And I can see the overlap, I, you know, can make sense of all the training you've done in terms of massage, conscious sexuality, trauma work, um, counseling work, et cetera, because that there's no, you can't separate Beams. it out. <laughs> yeah. 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 You can't separate it out. Um, and you work with all people, right? You work with men, women, non-binary, all different kinds of orientations. It doesn't matter, does it? Couples, thruples, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, of all orientations. Absolutely, absolutely. And anal mapping is also a thing, which uh -huh. I'm updating my website. So maybe by the time this comes out, I'll all be up to date. But yeah, <sighs> anal mapping, like we hold a lot there as well. And that is where the vagal nerve, um, you know, ends. So there's a oh, lot. Tell going me about that. I'm really curious about that <laughs> because... Well, like full yeah, disclosure, let, let give you. Oh, I've got like nine minutes. Let, we need to sum this up quickly, but we can do it. <laughs> so in my twenties, before I went into awakening slash psychosis, I was in a relationship with an amazing man, and we had a lot of anal sex, and he had a very large cock. So I like I know that it literally there was things happening on the energetic and the physical level that just opened me up in ways. So tell me about what happens when people release the stuff there and that nerve thing, the vagal nerve. <laughs> Uh, so the vagal nerve is the nerve of the parasympathetic nervous system, which is rest and digest. Um, and then there's intravagal and then there's a shut off. So it's when we go into freeze, like there's like a shutdown, like a kitten or a cat in the mouth, um, mouse in the mouth, you know. So anyway, but the vagus nerve is actually deeply relaxing. So when some when you relax the um the anus and you're when you open that sphincter because if you notice like even horses when they're at a starting gate and they're nervous they squeeze it so if you squeeze your anus right now everyone's squeezing their anus mm -hmm. breathe in and then just ah oh, let it go as you sigh out and actually realize that you probably had more tension there than you thought mm. and that by relaxing the anus and having um, this connection, then we're in a deep, really relaxed state, the ventral vagal state, which is where we have enormous creative potential. We're able to co-regulate with someone. And obviously this is anal stimulation or play in a safe environment where you feel connected and able to be fully present. Um, and as long as you're fully present and able to relax into it safely, then there can be an enormous source of this, well, the never really, again, that channel. So it's coming up and um, coming right up through into the brain, and it's called the wandering nerve. And it comes up through all the, like, the psoas and the digestive system and everything to create a deeply relaxed state that's a lot like a bliss state, like mm. a... You know, um, is it Ananda Maya? Ananda Maya. So, yeah. yeah, so that you're able to open up to um, ecstatic states of bliss and to be in an altered state. Mm. Yeah, I used to wonder because it, it really felt like it was like a full reset of my system. Mm. You know, it just felt like the whole computer was being turned off and on in a beneficial way. And I did always wonder, I'm like, I wonder how much that impacted me going into quite a strong awakening slash psychosis because of the it was relaxing the patterns as such for a brief time I would yeah I would say so actually I suggest if people want to relax that they get a butt plug <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah you know like yeah. it can be such a quick quick relaxation 
Yeah, yeah, I know. Working with Jane Thomas, he's a big fan of butt plugs. He's like, yep, just, you know, put your butt plug in whilst you're doing, writing your social media posts, you'll have a much more <laughs> organic. Aww. He's like, I just wear them all the time for work. <laughs> <laughs> he's awesome. <laughs> oh, my goodness. Uh, oh, oh, my can... goodness. Thank you so much for, I knew it would be an epic, juicy conversation. I have learned things. I'm sure the listeners, watchers have learned many things. Um, thank you for the way that you show up in the world and I will put all of your details in the show notes so that people can get in touch with you and book sessions if they're ready to how would you like if someone wants to book what are they ready for what are they ready for <laughs> what are they looking for someone who's looking for complete this sentence <laughs> uh, looking for whatever they're looking for I can't complete that sentence for someone they need to complete it uh, but if they if they want to go deeper in their sexuality and their intimacy and and uh, dissolve some patterns, yeah, yeah, if they want more more aliveness, more if they want to be more fully that which they are. Yeah, I love it. We'll leave it on that. <laughs> we'll leave it there. You are awesome. Thank you for showing up and all the work you do. Mm. Thanks. Yeah. Babe. Okay. Alrighty, folks. So that was Kim Summer. I knew we'd go some places. We went all the places. Yoni mapping, anal mapping. Of course, it's anal mapping. Like, I'm, I mean, I didn't know that, but I knew that, of course. Um, and I, it's so, so awesome to be able to talk about some of the ISTA stuff with someone who's a practitioner. Um, one of the, I guess, criticism that's, that has been leveled at me is that I don't speak to victims. And I'm totally open for that. But I also acknowledge that's a really challenging conversation to hold. And I need to be approached by someone. I mean, most of the people that I have on conversations with Carly are people I'm having conversations with. And I'm like, ah, oh, this would be a fantastic conversation. Do you want to come on the show? Um, so it, there is an open invitation there that I'm definitely willing to explore if someone has experienced abuse transgressions and wants to share what it was like for them what they would like to see from ISTA etc it doesn't even have to be ISTA it could be another organization do get in touch um these open compassionate curious conversations matter a lot to me um as always thank you so much for watching and listening do the share like follow thing there's some great excerpts in this post in the Facebook groups that are relevant because I'm not on Facebook anymore I need your help um, i got to run because people are showing up to my house, but so much love to you all. Thanks for listening to Conversations with Karalia and trust that you enjoyed that nuanced deep dive into spirituality, sexuality, power, and awakening. If you love my take on the spiritual path and you're looking for more insights like this, then make sure you subscribe and like. You can also check out my website, karaleah.com. That's K-A-R-A-L-E-A-H.com. And subscribe to my weekly newsletter.